Here we go. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Here we go. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Okay, welcome. This is uh, an exciting night. It is our final faculty reading at SCW 21, featuring our wonderful Tisha Filio and our wonderful-ish Brian Broom. <laughs> I had to. He's been the, you know, he's been poking. I had to come back a little bit. Okay, we love you, Brian Broom. Um, and so uh, I'm not going to spend any time on this stage. I'm going to instead, I'll let you know how we're going to do this tonight. We're going to have um, Mia Lanette introduce, come up in a moment to introduce Disha. Disha will give her reading and then we'll do a Q&A for just Disha. Same way we've been doing it, come up to the mic, ask your question. And then we will have uh, Brian's introducer come up and then Brian can the same. Okay, come on in. So without further ado, Mia Lanette. Good evening, friends, faculty, fellow classmates. It's so good to see you all in one room. I want to thank Sheila for this incredible honor and allowing me to present a powerful voice that is to take the stage in a moment. But I also want to take a moment to recognize the talent of this reader tonight. This woman was a finalist for the National Book Award, winner of the Story Prize, Penn Faulkner Award, and Los Angeles Times Book Prize for her highly praised short story collection, The Secret Lives of Kings. And as a woman who does not take the easy path out, this woman is one of ambition and strength that has inspired many black writers such as myself to cross a line and embrace wants and desires with an attitude of, I want it, I got it. <laughs> One of the things I admire about Disha Filial is her bravery to be fearless and vulnerable to put her emotions into her work. I had always believed that authors could never place themselves within their work. Um, it's almost like uh, the most taboo thing in the world or a literature 101 rule you should never, ever follow. After spending the week with her for workshop and countless reassurances through craft lectures, I've learned it is okay to put your personal experiences into fiction as a risk, that it's okay to take said risk to find your voice and identity of who you are as a writer and as a human being. I appreciate the hard work Disha has done and will continue to do in the future. She made a point in her interview with Penn America after she read a book called Daddy Was a Number Runner by Louise Merriweather. She mentioned, and I quote, it was the first time I saw myself in a book. Even though I was separated from the main character in terms of uh, time and place, I discovered that books can take me places and make my world larger than what it was outside my front door. And sure enough, it took her places as she discovered her own world that has brought praise and appreciation for bringing the troubles and hardships of religion, sexuality, race, and gender of black women to words. I am deeply honored to introduce this woman here tonight as she takes us into her world through her words and wisdom. Ladies, gentlemen, and all, I present to you, Tisha Filio. I tried to count the three like Monica said, but it's just that big. Um, Mia, thank you so much. And I am so proud of you for everything you're doing and everything you're going to do as a writer and as a person. So thank you. Um, how do I watch the time? Um, The first excerpt I'm gonna read is from a story called Snowfall. And um, it's gonna be from the middle of the story. And for anyone who hadn't read the story, but I think you all have, um, all you need to know about this excerpt is that 
the we is the narrator. Her name is Arlita, and she's writing about herself and her girlfriend, her partner, Rhonda. And they have moved um, from warm places in South to a very cold place that might sound a lot like Pittsburgh. We were born and raised in warmer places, Georgia and Florida, warmer too in the residual charm, polite smiles and gentility of the white people whose ancestors owned ours. In the South, the weather does not force tears from your eyes, causing the faces of passing strangers to register worry about you for a millisecond. It's the wind you want to tell them, but a millisecond is not enough time. In the South, the weather does not hurt you down to your bones or force you to wake up a half an hour early to remedy what has been done to your steps, your sidewalk, your driveway, and your car as you slept. But the South has hurricanes, they say. Yes, but not damn near daily, not for a full quarter of the year. You tell people up here that you're from the South, and nine times out of 10, they say the same old thing. I'm sure you miss the sunshine. Rhonda and I both miss taking sunshine and easy morning commutes for granted. But what we really miss are the laughter and embrace of our mothers and grandmothers and aunties, kin and not kin. We miss the big oak tables in their dining rooms where as kids in the 70s and 80s, we ate bowl after bowl of their banana pudding as they talked to each other about how much weight you gained like you weren't even there. We miss helping them snap groups. The young and the restless on the TV perched on the pass through. We miss how they loved Victor Newman, hated Jill Foster, and envied Miss Chancellor and how she dripped diamonds and chandeliers. We miss their bare brown arms reaching to hang clothes on the line with wooden pens. We miss their sun tea, brewed all day in big jars on the picnic table in the backyard, and then later loaded with sugar and sipped over plates of their fried chicken in the early evening. We miss lying next to them at night in their four poster beds with two soft mattresses covered by iron sheets and three generation old blankets. We miss their house coats, perfumed with absorbing junior liniment, and hints of the white shoulders they'd spritzed on from an atomizer that morning before church. We miss tracing the soft folds in their skin when we held hands and watched our favorite TV shows in their beds, Dallas, Dynasty, Knott's Landing, and Falcon Crest. We miss how they laughed and were easy with each other, how their friendships lasted lifetimes, outlasting wayward husbands and ungrateful children. Outlasted that time Alma caught Joe cheating and she whacked him on the top of the head with the sword he brought back from the war, but he told the people at the hospital he didn't know he did it. Outlasted having to hide your medicine bottles and your shoes because otherwise seven of your nine children were liable to steal them. We miss how they seem to judge everyone but themselves. Or maybe that judgment was in the nerve pills they procured from the Chinese doctor on Bay Street who didn't ask questions. We miss their furtive cups of brown liquor on Friday and unabashed cries for Jesus come Sunday. We miss their one gold tooth that made us wonder who they had been as young women. We miss their blue crabs, the shells boiled to a blood red and wash tubs atop bricks over makeshift fires built in the yard. The wash tubs reminded us of cauldrons full of rock salt and cayenne drenched water bubbling and rolling, mesh bags of seasonings and halved onions and peppers floating on top, along with potatoes and ears of corn. We miss how they stood over those cauldrons like witches stirring a potion with sweat beating on the tips of their noses and smoke swirling around their hands and wrists. They wielded long handled spoons to press the frantic flailing crabs toward their deaths. We miss how they made our Easter dresses and But we lost all those things when we chose each other. Only the memories remain, which is why, even though we grew up in different places, so many of our bedtime conversations start with, remember when, as we lie there in the dark with our nostalgia, 
and nothing, nothing to distract us from it, not even each other, not anymore. It's been a long time since I've read. <laughs> <clears throat> the next story is short enough for me to read in its entirety, and it's called Not Daniel. I parked in the shadows behind the hospice center and waited. I held a box of condoms on my lap, Magnum XLs. It was like being 16 again, except this time I bought the condoms instead of relying on the boy. This time the boy was a man I had mistaken for someone I'd gone to junior high with when our paths first crossed two weeks ago before at crossed two weeks before at the main entrance of the hospice center. I was coming, he was going. I thought he was Daniel McMurray, so I stared longer than I should have, and he stared back. Later that evening, I'd run into him again coming out of the room across from my mother's. His mother had breast cancer, mine ovarian. I checked my phone, 1027. I timed the Walmart run for the condoms pretty well. Not Daniel would be down in three minutes. To throw nurse Irie, the night nurse off the trail, we never left or returned to the floor at the same time. Her name wasn't really Irie, but I called her that behind her back because she was Jamaican. She was also mean as a snake. I had complained to the head of the center about her, suggesting that her brusque manner was better suited for the morgue. But nurse Irie liked not Daniel. She didn't cop an attitude when he asked questions about his mother's care. He told me she even joked with him late one night as he walked around the floor in his skimpy running shorts. What? You keep walking around here in those itty bitty ding? Back. Nurse Irie was not a stupid woman. Perhaps she would put two and two together and figure out that not Daniel and I were, what were we? What do you call it when your mothers are hospice neighbors and the nights are endless and sleepless and here's someone else who spent the day talking to insurance companies and creditors and banks and pastors and relatives and friends, some more well-intentioned than others. Someone else who is the dutiful son to your dutiful daughter, another family's chief shit handler, bail bondsman, maid, chauffeur, therapist, career advisor, ATM. Here's someone else who both welcomes and dreads death as it loiters in the wings, an unpredictable actor. What do you call it when that someone else wears a wedding band but never mentions his wife by name? A wife and two kids back home in the next state over. Don't ask, don't tell. At exactly 10.30, not Daniel tapped the passenger side window. For a few moments, we sat in silence the way we always did at first. Sometimes I would cry, sometimes he would too, because we could out here beyond the reach of our mother's Jesus, nurses on autopilot, empty platitudes and garbage theology about God's will disguised as comfort. And then eventually one of us would speak. But this night, how to begin? Pick up where we'd left off the night before when yet another rambling conversation about funerals and selfish siblings suddenly became kissing, became my t-shirt off, became my nipples and not Daniel's mouth. This is how we began. Not Daniel took the box of condoms for me, removed one and then set the box on the dashboard next to my phone. Then he set his phone on the dashboard. I knew his ringer volume like mine was on the highest setting because the call, that call could come at any moment. Then he took my face in his hands and looked at me. I dropped my eyes. No, he said, I need you to be here, all of you 
here. Lifting my eyes to meet his, I felt like Sisyphus pushing that rock. In his I blinked, blinked again until my vision cleared. In the back seat, not Daniel undressed me, undressed himself, and then buried his face between my legs. I reached over my head, clutched the door behind me, and cried as I came over and over again. By the time not Daniel put on the condom and pulled me to my knees, my legs were limp and useless. He turned me away from him, pressed his palm against the center of my back, and pushed me forward. He draped his body over mine and entered me. He was rough, but not unkind. I wondered whether he was thinking what I was thinking. What if one of our mothers dies while we're down here running around, as my grandmother would say? But in the cramped space of the back seat and of our grief and our need, there was no room for guilt or fear, only relief. And that's what I told not Daniel when we were both spent, our damp back sticking to the leather seat. Relieved, he frowned and then smiled. Relieved? Then I failed to deliver the goods. No, no, I said, you delivered the goods. The goods were delivered and received. But I do have a question. Shoot. Were you worried that one of them would die while we were down here? Thought never crossed my mind. Really? Really, listen, I can either deliver the goods or I can think about my mama dying or not. I can't do both. <laughs> and then I laughed, even though I felt like I shouldn't have, even though nothing was as it should be. Thank you. Um, I think I'll just do one more. I'll be gracious, Brian, and leave you time. <laughs> um, I'm going to read the first two pages of um, Peach Cobbler, and the thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Who makes me free work? Um, the thing that this, I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but one of the reasons I like to read this at events, um, especially where there are writers in the audience, is because um, this story got rejected more than any other story. It was never published anywhere before it was published in my book. Um, and yet when people tell me that they have a favorite story in the collection, it's usually this story. And so I just say that to say, this is very, all of this is very subjective. I talked last time about luck um, and finding the right fit and all of those sorts of things. And so it's just to encourage you that, you know, even your pieces that can get a lot of rejections can ultimately end up being some of your best work. <clears throat> My mother's peach cobbler was so good, it made God himself cheat on his wife. When I was five, I hovered around my mother in the kitchen watching, close enough to have memorized all the ingredients and steps by the time I was six, but not too close to make her yell at me for being in the way, and not close enough to see the exact measurement she used. She never wrote the recipe down. Without having to be told, I learned not to ask questions about that cobbler or about God. I learned not to say anything at all about him hunching over our kitchen table every Monday eating plate after plate of peach cobbler and then disappearing into the bedroom I shared with my mother. I became a silent student of my mother and her cobbler making ways, even when I was older and no longer believed that God and Reverend Troy Neely were one and the same, I still longed to perfect the sweetness and textures of my mother's cobbler. My mother, who fed me TV dinners, baked a peach cobbler with fresh peaches every Monday, her day off from the diner where she waited tables. She always said Sunday was her Saturday, and Monday was her Sunday, but what I knew was that none of her days were for me. 
And for many of those Mondays off and on during my childhood, God, to my child's mind, would stop by and eat an entire eight by eight pan of cobbler. My mother never ate any of the cobbler herself. She said she didn't like peaches. She would shoo me out of the kitchen before God could offer me any, but I doubted he would have offered even if I'd sat down right next to him. God was an old fat man, like a black Santa. And I imagined my mother's peach cobbler contributing to his girth. Some Mondays, God would arrive after dinner and leave as I lay curled up on the couch watching Little House on the Prairie in the living room. My mother and God would already be in the bedroom when I got home from school. I could hear moaning and pounding like a board hitting a wall as soon as I entered the house. I would shut the front door quietly behind me and tiptoe down the hall to listen outside the bedroom door. Oh God, oh God, oh God, my mother would cry. I could hear God too, his voice low and growly saying, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> That was amazing. Thank you. Okay, uh, Lori says she wants peach cobbler. <laughs> Me too, Lori. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna take a few minutes um, to answer some of your questions for Disha. So anyone, Arista, I see your hand already. So come on up. Go this way. So my question, <laughs> hello. Uh, my question is um, in part from Peach Cobbler because you write the character um, through many ages, so I'll start with five, mm -hmm. and uh, in your other stories. So I was wondering, what is it like um, to write for um, characters of different ages mm -hmm. and um, in completely different places in life, and also, what is it like to do it all together? So how do you put yourself in that headspace? Mm -hmm. And how do you remember what it's like to be five? <laughs> okay, so here's the cheat code. You just use the memories you have, right? <laughs> so, um, not that, you know, my mother was having an affair with a pastor, but, um, but the, you know, but, I, but to some extent, that's true. Some of my best and like, you know, the memories that really stick with me are, are of watching my grandmother in the kitchen. And that was the thing that frustrated me. I wanted to cook more than anything. And she would always say, I can't teach you how to cook. You just have to watch. And that was the worst thing to say to me. Like I hated everything about it, but she was right. She didn't let me like practice. I just watched her literally for years. And maybe when I was around eight, she was like, okay, now you can cook. And I knew what to do. Cause I just watch and watch and watch and, and you know, learn the, um, you know, the, the sequencing of things. She didn't, my grandmother didn't measure anything, but you just, it's just like by feel, you know, like how much salt something should have or, or whatever. But that's also one reason I don't bake because baking is chemistry and science and you do have to be more precise. And so I'm more of a savory cook. Um, Peyton is our, my pastry chef. So, um, so, you know, starting with the memories that you have. And then, so in my stories, in my collection, there are four generations. But of the children, um, they're all like me, my age. So again, I just used the memories I had. They all grew up in the 70s and 80s. So when, uh, you know, so that's Olivia in the beginning, um, watching her mother. And then when she's a teenager, you know, MTV is still kind of new. There's the Cosby show, there's the Fat Boys. Like those are all my memories and so it's the things that stick out there's plenty obviously that I you know I don't remember um so I just use what I have and then I also research um especially music like you can actually figure out like what was the number one R&B song in the country in 1987 like you can google or the, you know the top albums or um I wanted to think about like what Gile, I think it was Gile, what somebody might have been wearing at the time. I don't remember clothes as much, but sometimes I'll Google um, 
the fashions or I'll look at videos from that era to remind myself of what people were wearing. It's like, oh, they were, everybody was wearing bike shorts in 1987. You know, all genders were wearing bike shorts in 1987. So does that answer? Okay. Okay, we've got uh, we've got a question from Anna in the chat. How long do your short stories usually take to quote unquote finish from the initial inspiration to feeling like it's ready to publish? So that's a range. Um, in uh, the Secret Lives of Church Ladies, there's some stories that took years from start to finish, and then there are some stories that I wrote over a weekend, like right before the book was due. So that and everything in between. Did I miss a question? Oh, I did. I'm sorry. Mary, did you eat peach cobbler when writing your story? <laughs> I'll just share. I didn't. Um, I'm trying to think. I didn't eat peach. Uh, let's see. So my book, I turned my manuscript in in 2019, but this story was probably done, like the first draft of it was done in maybe like 2016, 2017. And as I mentioned, I don't bake a lot. So I probably would not have baked one, um, but I remember looking up recipes to make sure that I wrote accurately in the story, you know, what the process was. And then in uh, last year, when we were all kind of in, in quarantine, I baked one just because I was talking about peach cobbler all the time doing events. So I was like, I'll bake one. And then for some reason, I think it's April 13th or April 17th is National Peach Cobbler Day, even though peaches aren't in season. And, <laughs> and there's a, a, a writer and blogger named Alex Hardy, and he um, his brand is sort of, uh, what is it called? Alex, Alex Gotta Eat. And he does a lot of um, events around food. And so he, during um, quarantine, he would do these cook-alongs where he'd give you the recipe in advance and he'd usually have a guest, or sometimes it was just him. And you could either cook on Zoom with him with him, or you could just sit there and watch him cook if that's what you wanted to do. So he asked me to do a cook along and we made peach cobbler together, but we're gonna do it again now. Peaches are in season now. So I don't know who came up with National Peach Cobbler Day in April. Um, so I would say since writing about this, I've only baked them twice. So. Anyone else from the room? If you don't, I have a question. Can I ask a question? This actually has, it's connected to what you were just talking about, about the, the kinds of events that you've done for the book. And you should know that this woman is like a master planner of, of her own publicity. I mean, I was, she was very generous to share some of this with me while I was doing my own book stuff. Um, and it was just astonishing how much you have going. I did see the spreadsheet. She let me see the spreadsheet. I'm not showing it to anybody else. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the kind of creativity that sort of fell to you as opposed to maybe, or maybe even the kind of creativity that your, maybe your agent, your publicist, your publisher came up with you. Because I know you've done some really neat yeah. things around the book. So. Yeah. Um, one thing is, uh, gosh, I think it's July 12th, Sherry um, Flip's um, food studies class is inviting me to come and talk about peach cobbler and the history and, and so forth. So um, sometimes happen because somebody else has an idea like that where there's a connection. Um, I have a friend named um, Honoré Fanon Jeffers who, um, she has a poetry collection called, um, well, she has several, but the one that was long listed for the National Book Award is called The Age of Phyllis and it's about Phyllis Wheatley Peters. Um, and then her novel is coming out later this summer, um, The Love Songs of W.B. Du Bois. And Honoré and I are good friends. One thing we have in common, just Southern backgrounds. And so we decided to throw our own event and we just called it On the Porch. And, um, and just with the concept of, it's like the two of us sitting on the porch, just talking and, and people turned into Zoom to just listen to us talk. Um, about our work and about each other and about, you know, writers supporting writers. So that's something we made up. Um, another one is, uh, another thing you can do is look at commemorative months and, you know, like 
National Peach Cobbler Day and come up with an event for that. Or in my case, I wanted to do something around um, uh, Mental Health Awareness Month for May. And so um, a, a friend has uh, did an event with a therapist named Lisa Butler. So I reached out to Lisa and I said, I wanna do something in May, what can we do? And so she said, well, let me read your book. And so May is Mental Health Awareness Month, but it's also Mother's Day is in May. And so we did an event on mothers and daughters and that relationship and using my book as a springboard. And I never anticipated like how many people would show up for that. And we just did IG Live. So it was just the two of us and we could see people in the comments and people were sharing some really deep and personal things about their relationships with their mothers. And I had people follow up with me after that. Um, so it helps to keep the conversation fresh because as you can imagine, you get a lot of the same questions and things, but when you have these little topics or a little niche, um, it mixes it up a little bit. Um, I have had a number of conversations with um, pastors. So I had one, book club conversation with all black women pastors, like all super progressive. When they reached out and was like, we wanna uh, have a call with you. And I'm like, oh God, I'm in trouble, <laughs> you know? But they are like super duper, you know, progressive. So that was cool. Um, and, and then I have pastors who are friends and I've done, you know, things with them and, and we've found different ways to explore the book together. Um, one thing I have done, Uh, like a book club type event for um, for men and male identified people who wanted to talk about it and that I could observe, but that I wouldn't be a part of the conversation unless, you know, they had questions for me. That it, but just seeing what that community of people will do with this book, because some of the, you know, interesting feedback that I got about this book early on um, were from Black men in particular. And it was usually something along the lines of like, I thought I was gonna get some smut, but <laughs> you know, it was deeper than that. Or like my friend Caleb was like, I thought I was gonna get some erotica to share with my lady, but the ancestors spoke to me. And so I was like, well, I, you know, you can still, you know, get your erotica on. Um, it can be both. Um, so I'm really, you know, so I try to do things that I'm interested in. And Brian and I have talked about this with like doing book events and stuff that you do so much that you really want it to be things that you, you're happy, you're actually happy to be there and not just kind of phoning it in because it's just not fair to people who show up to support you to have you there and you're just sort of like, you know, just worn out, which is another reason why we try and say no to things because it can get to be too much. Um, but anyway, that wasn't the question. So I think, all right. I'm okay with time. Yeah. So it's six thirty-eight. I think we can probably do one more one more question. Uh, anybody from out here? Land? Uh, well, Arista, I saw Mark. So you already have no. You want both? Okay, Arista and then Mark, or Mark and Arista. I don't care. Who wants to come first? One of you, jump up. Mark wants to know what's now and next. Um. Now, I'm supposed to be working on a novel. Um, it's a novel that I abandoned that I started in 2007. And um, it's sort of now and next, which is I'm not gonna wait to work on it, but um, I got um, the John and Renee Grisham Fellowship for next academic year. So I'll be at Ole Miss and I only have to teach one class one day a week, um, but it's a paid fellowship and I will live in the Grisham house, which is this wonderful um, four bedroom house. It's on like 77 acres and in the woods. Um, and, I, and, all, and the whole purpose is to write that book. So I have no excuse. So that's, but I'm not gonna wait to start. I worked on it in probably like two weeks at this point, but I have been working on that novel. Um, it's changed a lot, obviously, since 2007. Um, but then like every other day, I think, do I want to do that or another short story? <laughs> so at the end of the 2022, 2023 academic year, I will have a book. I cannot guarantee what that book is going to be. Also, um, right 
happening now. Um, I do have my co-writer for my HBO Max um, to write the pilot. I have to have a co-writer because I don't have experience as a screenwriter. And so they needed to pair me with someone. And so um, months of conversations and reading scripts by black women, um, screenwriters, um, most of whom were also playwrights, which is a really interesting thing. And some of us talked about that here, but um, prose writers and playwrights are writing for Hollywood. Like sometimes they are showrunners. Sometimes they just are asked to write a pilot. Like PSA messaged me the other day and was like, this super really famous person just asked me to write this show. And then other times he's just asked to write an episode. So just know that as you're thinking about your career prospects, like this is something that can come from having a book that somebody might think, oh, you would write a great episode of Atlanta based on you know, this book that you wrote. Um, so I have a, my co-writer, um, she has several shows that she is, has either developed or is in the process of developing. Um, and I was so worried that like so many of them that I really wanted to work with and they wanted to work with me that she was gonna be too busy, but she has space in her schedule to, for us to work together. Um, so it's gonna be collaboration, which is where we spend a lot of time just talking and sharing ideas and sharing documents. And then eventually it becomes a script somehow. So um, that's happening. And um, I feel like I'm forgetting something really important. I'm judging a lot of contests right now, um, which you know takes some time and also, um, we've been talking a lot about um, writing community. And one of the things that you, know, you can do to be a good colleague is when, you're, when people, whether they're your friends or not, have books out. If it's a book that you feel good about and are excited about, you can write a blurb for them. And so people will ask you to do things like that. Um, so I've been trying to do that as much as I can do that and nothing else, just read other people's books. Um, so that, so it's kind of a mix, Mark, of those. Okay, I don't see anything in the chat. Arista, do you want to come up and ask your last question and then we'll follow up? Okay. Thank you. Um, so I sort of borrowing this question from Hedy, who doesn't know that. <laughs> um, it, in the sort of uh, pre-SEW Brightspace uh, work that we did, Hedy pointed out the importance of names in your collection and uh, not Daniel, for example. Yeah. And I was wondering um, how much you think about those mm -hmm. and, um, you know, how sig significant they are, if any of them change, and also not just the obviously meaningful titles to the characters, but also regular names, like why is Olivia, Olivia, um, sort of like that. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, I'm, I think, without exception, everybody's name means something, even if it only means something to me. Um, but definitely not, you know, anything random. Like Olivia, um, I got that name from uh, The Color Purple. Have you all read that? And um, Celie's baby, um, the, uh, her, her adoptive mother said, you know, I named her Olivia. Doesn't she just look like an Olivia? And it's just something about, it just, that, Clearly, you know, that mother loved that baby so much. And it was just something about the way um, that uh, actor said that line. It stuck with me. And, um, and so Olivia is a character who doesn't experience a lot of love from her mother. Um, but I wanted that connection that this name was once said with such love and such reference. So I wanted to call her Olivia. Um, Gile, you know, Bible story. Um, not Daniel. So um, <laughs> this is always tricky. I always tell people there are elements that are autobiographical, but I'm not going to get into what's true and what's not because, you know, 
But my, you know, it's not, I, I've written about this before that my mother was in hospice before she died. And um, going into the hospice, and I saw this guy that looked exactly like this guy named um, Charles McWhite that I had gone to school with. And, um, and so when it came time to name the character, I was talking to, and, and Charles and I went to middle school together, and I was talking to a friend named Daniel, who we, all of us went to middle school together, and I let him read the story, and um, he gave me some great feedback, and I said, I'm going to call him not Daniel, and name him for somebody I did go to middle school with, but not the actual guy. So, like, things, there's, you know, little connections like that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I am now very happy to call Karen Cleoso to the microphone to introduce Brian. I'm like, I go, hi. <laughs> I'm so pale. Um, hi, Zoom. Okay. Hi, everyone. I want to do that thing where I'm like, hi, I'm Karen. I have magic in me. But no, oh, okay. <laughs> um, all righty. If the last year taught us anything, it's that the world is and always has been on fire. That white hot flame that burns within each one of us a fuming frustration born from being treated as less than or seeing others mistreated can and did set the world ablaze last year. And as artists, we probably felt that burn more deeply than others because as emotional and spiritual historians, we cannot afford to avert our gaze. Even when our unstable world under heaven goes up in smoke before our eyes. As artists, our role in society demands that we keep our eyes steady not shying away from the hurt to then through our art, be able to hold a mirror up to the world and say, see, none of us is truly alone in our heartbreak. But more eloquently, put more eloquently by James Baldwin, an artist's role is to make you realize the doom and glory of knowing who you are and what you are. They have to tell because nobody else in the world can tell what it is like to be alive. But, and let's be honest, Netflix and TikTok have once again proven themselves to be a lifeline connecting us with other lonely animals when government mandated isolation kept us from feeling, feeding our primordial need to socialize. And while Brian Broom's Punch Me Up to the Gods will transcend this cultural moment to be seen as a necessary and groundbreaking piece of literature, it did come to us at a perfect time in our history. It came to me at a perfect time in mine. You see, I've struggled with my social identities my whole life, and I still do. Some days I don't feel woman enough, being childless and unmarried at 40. And there are days when no matter how big my hoop earrings are, I'm not Cuban enough. My Spanish rolls smoothly off the tongue for the first few minutes or so, only to hit a wall a few sentences in, begging for help, with a, como se dice, carburetor. <laughs> I'm loud, which is not very ladylike. I don't hide behind anonymity or 12-step meetings, which means I'm not a good addict in recovery. And I'm constantly stressing out about my weight, which is not body positive at all. I'm also named Karen. <laughs> So imagine my surprise when I saw myself in Brian Broom, a black gay man trying to survive in America. It was no surprise actually. Like Baldwin, when I enter a world rendered on the page, I want to be stretched, shook up, to overreach myself when reading and I want others to feel the same way too. And Brian Broom's spectacular debut does just that. His memoir outlines personal yet universal struggles this Cuban immigrant connected to on so many levels. In Punch Me Up to the Gods, Broom takes readers on an unflinching journey of self-discovery and self-acceptance. 
Broom navigates the toxic blackmail stereotypes he was force fed as a child in one powerfully crafted scene after another, showing us as each powerful story unfolds that we are not so different in our pain and that we are at once complicit in perpetuating the very constructs that imprison us. From our first encounter with Tuan to the beaches along the French Riviera, Broom subjects readers to one guttural punch to the stomach after another, enlightening us along the way, showing us that while we are all working against prescribed identity models that we might survive and become who they are meant to be, as long as they can accept themselves and others as they come. As a writer, I'm in absolute awe of the numerous craft techniques that Broom employs all working seamlessly together, almost as if by magic. There's the powerful Gwendolyn Brooks poem that organizes the stories, an ongoing delicate dance between parallel experiences taking place in past and present, a heartbreaking POV switch that much like those found in Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, give us a much needed second perspective on how performing our expected identities can have devastating and lasting effects on the self and communities. There are also what I like to call drop the mic moments, <laughs> which close each chapter on poetic and poignant resonating notes, which take the breath away. And then there's little Tuan, who will grow up to understand the world as we know it, and it's absolutely devastating. Doom and glory on every page. Using humor to make our narrator relatable and not shying away from vulnerability, Broom provides readers with an intimate look at the experience of one black gay man, who as Broom puts it in an interview with Pittsburgh City Paper, is getting it from both sides. Racism from the general public and homophobia from black people and the general public. And it's just a whole world of people telling you that you shouldn't exist the way that you are. Punch Me Up to the Gods is a rallying cry to brother and sister outsiders everywhere. It demands a seat at the table and continues an important conversation about the ways in which our expectations of social identity performance can chip away at the soul of those that don't fit a prescribed mold. As writers, our aim should be to emulate the unabashed audacity and hard work that is required to publish work like Punch Me Up to the Gods. It says, hey, these underrepresented, uh, oh, underrepresented narratives matter. It says we demand space on the shelf. It says this right here is all that a life can hold. And if not, then we as artists are not showing the world our full potential. Or as Carl Jung wrote, kindling a light in the darkness of mere being. We have a saying in Spanish, Te traje con el pensamiento. I was going to try and make you cry and I'm getting emotional. Okay. Pensamiento. <laughs> it means I summoned you into my life with my thoughts. Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, at least one of us is crying. As I struggled this last year to stay on course with my MFA, I thought a lot about my identity and my purpose. Constantly renegotiating both, confused and frustrated, but then there he appeared, Brian Broom on our syllabus, to show me the way and remind me why I wanted to be a writer in the first place. Lucky for me and for us, we have a Chatham alum who has paved the way with his phenomenal coming of age debut. I couldn't be any prouder to be entering my final year at Chatham inspired by one of our own. Please join me in welcoming Brian Broom to the stage. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now I'm going to bring the room down. <laughs> Just the class level is a left of plumbing. I, I just kind of decided I wanted to read this a few minutes ago. I think 
or I'm going to read a thing. So please uh, join me in this story. Ready? The only two things in life that can tell you who you really are, what you're really made of, are war and public sin. I know nothing of war except the images I've seen of desperate men locked in combat or wandering around the battlefield, exposed and vulnerable. I know perhaps too much about public sin. When I say public, I'm not referring to that vanilla elevator sex that men and women have in psychological thriller movies, the muscle stud with perfect hair who grabs hungrily at some sexy ingenue's panties in an area where they may or may not get caught, like a coat check room. Straight people can just look funny with that. No. I'm talking about full on, ass out, naked body contact with strangers that you've only caught glimpses of in the dark. I'm talking about insertions, wet moments, the kind of furtive and dirty coupling where it'd be rude to stop in the middle just because you discovered that your partner. I'm talking about the kind of adventurous sex that gets men killed. I'm talking about gay badass. The kind of sex we used to have in the mid 90s before gay men became so goddamn cuddly. I'm talking about Arena Health Club in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania sex, a place where filthy public sex was not only encouraged, but mandatory. If you walk inside the Arena Health Club, you would be, better be ready to fuck. Pick someone, anyone. Because if you weren't engaged in the act of coitus at the arena, you would be asked to leave. No questions asked. Great. My first time at the arena was due to too many drinks, my first blast of cocaine, and my big mouth. Cocaine was incredible. And I tried it mostly because I wanted my new friends to like me. I pretended as if I'd done it thousands of times before, when truthfully, I'd only learned how it's done moments before, when I watched them fish dollar bills out of their pockets, roll them up, shove them up their noses, and deeply inhale lines from the back of the toilet seat in the men's room. They tilted their heads back. Sorry, they tilted their heads back covering one nostril, and they made sounds as if they'd just been splashed in the face with cold water. I mimicked them, trying to make a big show of how savvy I was. I rolled up my bill, shoved it up my nose, leaned over the toilet seat, and promptly exhaled. <laughs> You've been there? Um, and promptly exhaled, blowing cocaine in all directions. My companion sighed, deep sighed, as he laid out another line. I tried again, and when that line hit my system, I knew immediately that cocaine would be a mainstay in my life. It made me feel invincible. In an instant, I was the person that I'd always wanted to be. It hit my nasal passages and burned so much that I fanned my hand in front of my face. I'd just eaten a ghost pepper. But after a few seconds, the drug worked its way into the back of my throat, filling it with that new car smell. Dark corners of my brain that had remained dormant for years and my entire existence suddenly lit up and sprang to life. My eyes widened and my shoulders relaxed. I had been hanging out at the bars with two friends, Tate and Jeremy, both bona fide sluts. And after a long and unsuccessful evening of trying to get laid, they suggested that we go to the arena. I did not know what the arena was. I was still new to the scene, but wanted to seem experienced. The blow they'd offered me hours before was still working its magic. It forced words that weren't true to escape the lips on which I couldn't stop chewing. Eventually the drug worked, eventually the drug took control of my entire mouth. 
the words felt so good and free as I flew from between my teeth and tongue, endless and meaningless, until eventually my words told him that sure, I've been to the arena a thousand times before. My words told, words told all of us that I knew the doorman, and the doorman knew me, and that in the arena, we'd be welcome with open arms. Between frequent and jerky drags of my cigarette, I told him to stick with me because I knew the arena would be with all of us. These were the heady days of gay sex positivity. After the onslaught of AIDS, we were all trying to reclaim our sexuality in bold, daring, unapologetic ways. I was just trying to claim mine for the first time. But I pretended I had had lots of sex, all kinds, whips, chains, top, bottom, auto repair pumping, asphyxia. According to my words, I had done it all. But the reality was that I had never had sex beyond the occasional romantic interludes when I was only 18. With one longtime boyfriend who had been as clueless as I was. We didn't know what we were doing. We were gentle with each other. He asked me if he was hurting me. He asked me if I was comfortable. He slapped down on me. Sometimes we just gave up in the middle and watched old movies instead. But Tate and Jeremy had a handle on this sex thing. They had it gripped by the shaft and were milking it for all it was worth. They were my idols. Years old, the same age as me, and were so much more grown up and casual about this gay thing. They pulled it off flawlessly. They were aloof and bitchy, stylish but not fussy. They were, in a word, cool. I didn't want to look like a prude. Tonight, it would be just the three of us taking on the Arena Health Club. As they talked more about it, it began to dawn on me what the arena actually was. I recoiled a little, but didn't let it show. Maybe I would meet someone new at the arena, start a new relationship. Maybe there was a cafe <laughs> where he and I would get to know each other better and be more sexy. I pictured alabaster, white, Doric, collar, and plant life. An azure blue pool. Maybe this gay life wasn't so scary, so threatening, so alcohol and drug driven as it seemed. Maybe I could let my hair down a little, try something new. I talked a big game in the cab, headed to the arena. With every street lamp that whizzed by, I heard myself make up a new story of sexual adventure. I heard myself telling them that once, yeah, I showed up for a dinner party only to find that all the guests were naked. It was mostly men, but yeah, there were some women too, I said, but I didn't care. I pretty much just fucked everybody. And when I was done, I smoked a joint that made me horny all over again. So I just dived right back in onto the pile and started fucking everybody again. Boy, that was one crazy night. But that's what I'm like, you know? If I see it and it looks good to me, I just start fucking it. According to me, I had been involved in three ways, and orgy is covered from tip to toe in genitals. There was no sexual situation that I was intimidated by. My lips were numb with cocaine and lies. I got carried away in the adventure of the adventure of it all. I was quaking from the kind of good gayo that you could only get back then. The cab driver stared straight ahead, and Tate and Jeremy barely raised my eyebrows. In truth, all night long, they only seemed to be putting up with me. I knew they didn't like me. But the more evident this became, the harder I tried. I clung to them and followed them around. I laughed too loudly at their jokes. I just hold And I hoped that somehow I could trick them into tempting me at the arena without knowing they were doing so. I knew I was certain much smarter than they were. You walk through the door, then you pay the man, then you get naked. Tate said this as we approached the door of the health club. He sounded exasperated. Somehow he knew that I had done it. 
Or the arena sat in the middle of a seedy neighborhood. It looked like a dilapidated old house. I walked in the door, paid the rent, and then I got naked. They supplied me with a towel so small that it could only just be held around the waist with a forefinger and thumb with an out of fiber to spare. I could tell immediately that there would be no cafe. <laughs> there was no spa, no door at columns. Also, there was no workout equipment. Making me question whether or not this place was really a health club. The arena health club itself looked unhealthy. Dark and brooding with paint peeling off the walls and all manner of haunted voices coming from the dark corners inside. I stood in the entrance, taking it all in and turned to my friends, but no one followed. The smell of Jeremy's freshly applied Drekhan Noir hung in the air. I was naked and alone. If you are at a gay bathhouse and not participating in sex, you are a suspect. The man who handed us the tiny towel and who I gave the money to barked at me to get moving. From behind, I must have looked as though I was slowly marching to the hangman's noose. The fingers of one hand straining to keep the tiny towel in place and the other straight down at my side, refusing to touch anything before disappearing into the darkness. It was like walking into a funhouse. <laughs> the noises that men make echoed all around me from unseen places. I had no idea what to expect, but expectations are useless when you're surrounded on all sides by human beings. Stop its effects on me. My heart was now pounding. I was covered in a thin layer of sweat, a sweat that was now making I was surrounded by dark and seemingly endless hallways with doors on both sides. Some doors were open and some were closed. The open ones held naked men inside who wanted to see. You wanted me to see what they were doing to each other. They looked right into my eyes as I passed, hungry for attention. A man on his knees removed another man's penis from his mouth, point and laughed at my slow and tentative tiptoe down the hallway. Open doors loud with sucking and slapping sound. I could pick my pleasure. It was like a sex museum in which I was the sole patron. At the end of the hall was a door with a celestial light emanating from it, bright as heaven's gate. The lone man inside was on the bed, on his knees with his face turned away and shoved down into the pillow. His skin was white as marble. Like the famous Roman statue with no arms and no legs, no head. His hands were placed over each buttock, pulling them apart to reveal his blood red anus like an open wound. I turned and ran. I ran back down the hallway into another where men were standing around, relieved of their tiny towels, cackling with laughter as I scurried by. I ran past the salacious looks and annoyed frowns. Some grabbed for me, and I jumped away, yelping like an injured sea lion. It was still early in the night, and not many men had found a partner yet, but I could run no longer. I skulked through the hallway, head down, stiff upper lip, until they all eventually disappeared inside private rooms or into corners where eyes were closed and heads were thrown back in ecstasy or deeply bowed and bobbing. I walked past a large room where seemingly dozens of men were all on one bed, all arms and legs and grunts, and I caught a brief glimpse of Tate's face in the fret underneath the dim blue light. His back was arched, eyes closed, head thrown back, and he was covered in hands. I expected I would just roam the hall silently all night until my friends woke up and I could go home, my safe little home. I expected that it would all be over soon.
the biggest, fattest white man I have ever seen was standing at the end of the corridor. There was a fluorescent light flickering, flickering out and shorting just over his head. He was breathing heavily, shoulders heaving. He stepped out of the light and into shadow and took two steps toward me, his bare feet landing with two distinct thuds on the concrete floor. I could feel his eyes sizing me up for a moment. I could feel his face contort. He began barreling toward me, hairy and Cro-Magnon. I stood for a moment, eyes wide and mouth agape, before I pinched up my tiny little towel and ran for my life. He came after me, undeterred. I ran so fast as I could run as well as the, well, sorry. He came after me, undeterred. I ran as fast as I could run in a tiny towel. I looked over my shoulder and saw his eyes narrow with determination. I could hear his bare footfalls slap thumping against the concrete and his rough panting in hot pursuit. There was no one there to help me. Lost as I was inside the corridors at the Arena Health Club, a, pay, a place where I had no business being to begin with. For an instant, I thought I was going to die there. What would my mother say? How would she explain this at choir practice? I ran through the club, taking dizzying turn after dizzying turn with a deranged, horny white man determined to fuck me to death right on my heels. I made a turn to the left and interrupted two men in a passionate embrace who looked up mildly annoyed when I said breathlessly, there's a man. They both gave me an irritated look and said, of course there's a man. <laughs> so I kept on running. The big, the big white man was not giving up. He was not taking the hint, despite my full sprint and my tiny towel. I ran to the empty natatorium downstairs. The door boomed loudly as it slammed behind me. The fear of AIDS had permanently closed the pool a long time ago, haunting the cavernous space with the echoes of splashing of lovers' pads. It was now a dry riverbed drained of all its water and river with all manner of detritus resting at the bottom. I hid behind a set of mini bleachers that were set up outside the pool for spectator viewing of the wet and wild flooded to go on inside. I hid and held my breath until it burst from my chest. And I heard the telltale footsong, footfalls of a maniac thundering against the concrete, echoing now. Just he one way in. There was only one way out. His footsteps got closer until I could hear his inhalations coming raspy and heavy. And I looked around frantically trying to find another escape route. Please, he said, in the gentlest way possible. This one word echoed, bouncing off the wall to surround me on all sides. I saw you walking around out there. You don't look like you belong here. He waited. Please, he said again. I love, I love black men. You, you in here? His voice cracked and was brittle with emotion. He rounded the corner while I was standing in front of me, hiding there, standing right in front of me. I could see that his rough breathing was not the maniacal boasting of a fuck either, but of a large man who was having a little trouble moving his massive weight. He towered over me, bearded and bedraggled. He looked like every truck driver I had ever seen at a rest stop on the turnpike. His eyes were just bloodshot, not blazing, not demonic. He seemed tired. He seemed tired all the time. He looked down at me and I started to tell him that I had no interest and I was going to scream if he touched me, but I was not afraid of him. Something sad in his manner let me know that he meant me no harm. What I saw in his eyes was a gasping loneliness, pure and simple, the kind of loneliness that begs for some, any form of humanity to reach out and touch. I saw the deep despair of the wet eyes a big naked trumpet. He reached out to take hold of my tiny towel and I slowly pushed his hand away and, my, and, and shook my head. He looked disappointed. 
I didn't know what to say. So without a word, I moved past him and walked slowly through the door that I had come through. And his loneliness left. Kate and Jeremy met me at the entrance, both fully dressed and looking stunned. I told them stories. I told them lots of things that they did. Did more cocaine, lots of it. When I drank, we learned to live for both alcohol and cocaine, and wouldn't go a day without either one or the other or both. They were the two things that seemed to make me everything I wasn't, bold, fearless. Because as far as I know, the first rule of being a man was to have dominion over women. And since I couldn't do that, I wanted to master a different kind of manliness that was popular, accepted, and even praised as the most masculine in my tribe, that of the promiscuous drunk. I would eventually graduate from Barkett Cranberry to straight Jack Daniels go back to the arena health club all on my own. I got better at it every time with a full head of whiskey and blow. The arena health club no longer exists. It burned to the ground under what some consider mysterious circumstances. One young man died in the club. But I can show you exactly where it was. I can show you the exact geographical spot that sparked the end of my innocence. And when the lights in my life slowly began to do. Thank you. Sorry, Patsy. You do everything. I do. I'm doing everything. Okay. Okay, Brian, thank you. Um, okay, questions. We'll start. Let's see. I don't see anything in chat yet. So, anybody in the room? I don't see any hands. I see one hand. Valentine, come on up. Wonderful reading. In that chapter, um, there's a lot of just human experience. Um, Especially with, sorry, who? Um, <laughs> so much crying today. Um, especially when you are so vulnerable about wanting your friends to like you. And I guess like everybody's felt that. And this is the first time I've ever read it in a book. And I just wanted to ask you how you were vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> How how are you went in that vulnerability? Like how how did you get into that? Am I wrong? Did you go into journals? Like how how do you do that? Um, uh, you know, I think I still do that. <laughs> you know, like I go into spaces. Like coming here, I was like, I thought I hope people like me. You know, um, I I think that. You know, while writing this book and when writing in general, I try to, um, and I, I, I'm probably going to talk a little bit about this on Saturday. Like, I try to just sort of strip away like any semblance of pride. <laughs> you know, like the, the thing about when I was writing this book is I was also in rehab, right? And so what was happening was I was writing this book and then. I was going into these group therapy sessions trying to get sober. And the, the two ended up working together because I would go into these group ther therapy sessions and like the, the group leader would be like, what are you hiding? Like, what are you, if you're gonna get sober, you gotta tell the truth. You gotta talk about how fucked up you are. You gotta talk about like how pathetic you are in some ways, how needy you are. You know, there's a, there's a, a saying in, Recovery, like you're only as sick as your secrets. So I was hearing that every day. You're only as sick as your secrets. And then going back to my room and trying to write a book. And it just worked out where I would be afraid to say something like on the page. And I would remember back to the group therapy session that day and be like, shit, I may as well put it in. Like, you know, <laughs> it's the worst that could happen, you know. And what I'm finding is that people, 
you know, much like yourself, like are like, yeah, this is not an uncommon feeling. And that is actually really gratifying um, as a writer. Anybody in the chat? Uh, oh, yes. Okay. From Carolyn Horwitz, the question is, when did you realize that the incident on the bus with Tuan would be braided into your memoir? Much to my editor's chagrin, like pretty late on in the process. Um, we were, you, like we, I mean, the, the book was kind of like, I think more than halfway. And I um, took a trip and I got on the bus and I saw this boy and I was like, there's no way that's not going in my book. Like, and then there was a whole new set of stuff to deal with, you know, um, of restructuring that had to be done. But it wasn't the beginning, like it was not. I was just writing these, like, yeah, I, I was just writing these essays. And then as I was writing these essays, which, you know, I started writing in rehab, like we, I was at Chatham and I was introduced to the Gwendolyn Books poem. And I was like, there's no way that's not going in the book. Um, and I, and that's, that started that whole thing. And then I saw Antoine and his father. And I was like, no way that's the matter. It was like, what the, dude, you got to stop like adding things, you know? So it just sort of happened. It was just going to be like, a, it was going to be like separate stories. And then the Brooks poem came. And then I, it, so it was late. I think the Tuan narrative, the, the initiation of Tuan was like later was the last thing that they would allow me to like, you know, because then I'd be like, I want to put my grandmother's apple pie recipe in. And they would have been like, dude, you got to stop. Um, so that was the last thing that I was allowed because they, they thought it made sense. So I was lucky in that they allowed me to do that. Okay, anybody here? Mary, come on up. Hey. Hi. <laughs> so there's this one chapter um, in your book, and you write this whole thing about this shirt that you desperately want in the store. Mm. And so we hear the, like the chapter, and we think it's over, but then you come back to it later and talk about how your father burned the shirt, and that's what kills us. Mm. And so I want to know how did you decide to put that later on and have like the final moment be there. Mm. That's, that's kind of specific. I know that when I was writing that, I, that at the time, the burning of the shirt wasn't the point of the story. I wanted it to be about my mother and how in that moment, she, I, I felt like she saw me, you know? Um, and she was like, oh, that, that pink shirt. Oh, I guess I got to get it. This is like who my kid is. And like, I, I wanted it to be about her. And I knew in the, in the writing, I knew um, that I had gone at some point to the trash barrel behind the house and I saw like the remnants of the shirt and like I knew who was responsible. Um, and just to be clear, I asked my mom, I was like, did I burn that shirt? And she was like, yeah, didn't want to tell you. I think it was because in the moment, in that story, I didn't want it to be about my father sort of like chipping away. I wanted it to be about my mother's building up of me. Um, and so I decided, you know, I don't want it. I, I didn't know if I was going to put it in at all, but then like at the end, I was like, yeah, I may as well tell, you know, that. So it wasn't like a big, huge decision. It was just a matter of what I was trying to um, get across in that story at the time. just wanted to say about that detail that it's it's so effective because it's you're using it for characterization you know for your, both your mother and your father and you yeah. um and then when we encounter it you know the first time and then the second time it's the same object but with a completely different re resonance yeah. it's really really good okay anybody else come on thanks
And so what I wanted to know is how did you manage to balance some of your more painful truths that you shared with this like almost undertone of dark humor that I think came through a lot more when we when we got to hear you read it aloud? Because I mean people were even like laughing a couple of times when you were saying some of the things. And also like how did you decide on that persona? So um well you know I get in trouble for saying this, but I'm going to say it. Sometimes traumatic shit is funny. <laughs> you know, I mean, when you not in the moment, obviously, but when you look back at it, like, you know, there's a story in the book called uh, Game Theory, uh, where I am trying to perform cunnilingus on a woman. And um, I was literally, I was trying to do it, do it well. I just knew I had this thing licked. Come on, guys. <laughs> um, but in the moment, I was trying to prove that I could be heterosexual. I didn't want to be heterosexual. I knew that if I just did this right, something would click, and then I would be heterosexual, and then I could lead a normal life, and I could be normal, and you know, and, and everything was riding on this, right? So a lot was riding on on my friend. Pleasure. And you know, and I was in there just making a muck of it, like just not, not doing it right. And I think in the book I say, like I slammed my face in like I was bobbing for apples. And when she finally was like, just please get it off, you are ruining my life, you know. Um, I was devastated. But I remember when I was writing about it, she said, You are looking at my pussy like made out of math. And that is hilarious. <laughs> and, you know, I talk to my students all the time about the camera of writing, like the camera, like, where is the camera when she said that? You know, where is the camera? It's looking down on me, completely failing at her vagina. Like, it's hilarious. It's hilarious. And, and, and you know, and a lot of the things that I look back on that were so painful in the moment. If I pick them apart and move the camera around, like they're funny, you know? Like it's funny to picture me running around a bathhouse trying to hold a towel, like it looks like this. It's hilarious. And so it's not a persona that like, I think I decided on. It's, it's more like, you know, this is kind of like what happens in life sometimes you look back on something that really hurt you badly in the moment. And you find a kernel of like humor in it. And that's what I try to bring out. Not always, you know, everything traumatic isn't doesn't have humor in it. Some things are just horrible. But some of the things that I write about, I'm like, that's that's a little funny, you know. So yeah. Okay. Nothing in the chat that I see. I see Loving. Come on. So I think you do this really cool thing with perspective throughout your book. Um, and I noticed in a few points where it was like very deliberately different. Um, and one of them, I think it was the spelling bee chapter, where it's like from like current perspective of your childhood self. And then obviously the chapter where you're speaking from your mother's perspective. I was wondering if you could tell us like how you decided to do that, like why, and like what you did to sort of flip into those perspectives. Um, I think that I, I did that, and I think it's a very, I got tired of listening to myself. Um, I really did. Like I got tired of just this voice, like talking in my head, like as I was writing, like just listening to this guy go on and on and on. And so I was like, well, what if I talk, what if I talk to the younger version of myself? Um, maybe he's got a different way of looking at things. And he did, you know. Um, and I um, in order to sort of change that, I've looked at old pictures of myself. You ever look at an old picture of yourself when you're really young? You're like, who the hell is that person? Like, you know, you're a completely different person. It started to resonate with me about how it was, like who was I? What did I think? Like, I know that it was before I started to code switch. 
meaning like there was a point in my life where I started to use the diction that I am using now. I used to talk like a black child, right? And so I wrote it out like that. Um, and then my publisher was like, you can't, nobody's gonna understand a word of this. You're gonna have to switch it up. So I just remembered the perspectives that I had. I used to think that God made white people and God made black people and they were supposed to be stuff. I used to think these things, right? But once I got into that, like, space, I, it was easier to write as myself. And I was just ruminating on my horrible school. And, you know, the smell of that, you know, when you ever come, you come back to school and there's a smell of school, my school always smelled like that. So, you know, I went into uh, a couple of elementary schools. I was invited, I wasn't just creeping around elementary schools. Um, I went and I smelled that smell and like, you know, and that put me back there. Um, pencil boxes and things that don't exist anymore. I just sort of wrapped myself in that stuff and then wrote that. And for my mother, I just went and stuck a microphone in her face. Um, and I said, I'm writing a book. And she said, you're doing a what now? And I said, I'm writing a book, I wanna interview you. And I asked her very specific questions, right? I didn't ask her how she felt or anything like that. I said, I mean, there were questions I hadn't asked her before and she answered them very directly. Well, I was 16, well, I did this. I used to work in a, I was a maid. And I just took her regular two or three word answers and I, I started, I was like, well, how would that have felt? You know, to have all these like ideas and dreams of what you want to be and just kind of have them like, because of patriarchy, let's just name it, you know, she got pregnant and you couldn't just be pregnant. You had to be married. And like, and I started thinking like, what, how, you know, how would that have felt? And how would she have felt with other this man to whom she was kind of forced to marry, lonely as hell, you know, with these kids you didn't ask for, in this house you don't want, in this place you don't want to be, and you're just stuck. And I just, I used her voice, um, and I just sort of put in there how I might feel in that situation. And I was very afraid of when she would read it, um, and she did read it, and uh, she told me that I had nailed it, which was great which was great. Like she was like, that is how I felt. And that is how your father made me feel. And you did a really good job. So that was great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Want to take one more? Anybody out there? Come on, Scott. One of the lines that's really stuck with me, um, he said his father told him it was better for a black man to beat his son to death than for a white man to kill him. He said he would never let a white man get his hands on his kids. He'd kill him himself first. So I just thought this is like a, I mean, the book's about the relationship with your father. It's about toxic masculinity. These lines that your father would rather kill you than see white people kill you first you know in a, in a generic sense i mean that's a, it's a, to me it strikes me as like both a perfect encapsulation of toxic masculinity but also something that only can be said from the african-american experience and so i'm just wondering sort of that that dual weight of trying to capture both at once something that you know it's a toxic masculinity but also a, a, an essentially um black experience of toxic masculinity I mean, I, yeah, you know, like I think masculinity, this toxic version of it, does a couple of things, it, and it starts to, it, 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 it takes away all the tenderness out of love, and it replaces it with ownership. You know, I think that men who love, men might legitimately love these men who practice this thing called toxic masculinity. Like, I think they might legitimately love their wives or children or whatever, but they can't process that. Like, and they, it turns into ownership. This thing is mine and I can do what I want with it. It mutates it into a very strange thing. I think my father, I think I have ever, was like, I mean, he really truly believed that, you know, I will kill you myself before I let white people take another thing from me. 
I will do it myself. Also because, you know, my uncle Clint, who I never met, um, was something that my father, it was a person that my father felt was taken from him by white people. Um, and yet there is a direct crossing of like the, the experience of racism and the experience of masculinity that has performed, you know, um, the tenderness is taken out of everything when you feel like you own everything. You feel like everything is owed to you. It's taken, the tenderness is taken from love. Tenderness is taken from sex oftentimes, you know. Um, so my father was definitely somebody who felt like if I cannot be the owner and the master of all I survey, then I don't know what to be. And I think therefore it, tur it turned into, then I will be nothing. He couldn't think of anything else to do um, when all of that was taken from him. And I think he felt by my mother going and getting a job and like taking the helm, like she was taking this thing that was rightfully his. Um, and I feel like he felt that way towards her. You know, I'll kill you before I let somebody else take you. It's a very strange way to look at people. And it is a it is a trait that I think is bred into American men oftentimes, you know. Um, and it's one that I'm trying to like weed out of myself, and I hope that other men are, are working on. I think the conversation about this kind of stuff is just beginning. You know, I saw Lil Nas X making out with some dude on the BET Awards the other day, and I was like, Ooh. you know, <laughs> like the conversation has begun, you know. The converse, we are well into the conversation, right? Because that was on a black stage in front of black people. And the idea of being masculine is conflated, I think, not just in the black community, but I'm talking about the black community. Masculinity and strength are conflated. They are not the same thing. You know, they are not the same thing. Um, and again, I think the conversation is just beginning and I, I hope that the book can be a part of that conversation um, as we continue to have it. Seems like a great note on which to end. Before we applaud Brian, uh, I hope this doesn't come off, you know, like, I don't know, in some strange way, I was never your professor at Chatham, thank God. <laughs> But he, he used to come to my office and steal food and also just hang out and be like, I'm working. What do you need? No, I'm, I'm very glad to have you as a friend. And more than that, as the folks that have been chatting, we are very, very proud of you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Zoom. We love you, Zoom. See you tomorrow. Good night, everybody. Enjoy.